Okay, good morning, everybody. A couple of empty seats this morning. I think it was a late night for uh, many of us. As of 2 o'clock this morning, uh, this is the data set that we have, which, as you can see, is made up of 46 pairs of gesture data corresponding to pairs of digits. One of the challenging things, among other things, for deliverable five is how good is good? How good should my KNN be, be doing? It's hard to say. Depends on your hand. Depends on the orientation. This, is, this looks to me pretty good. As you can sort of see uh, by taking a quick glance through the data set here, which is now in deliverable six and available for you to get started on, you can sort of get a feel uh, for what, what data is there. And you can see, generally speaking, what the result of cutting and centering and filtering and so on has done to our data set. So as of 2 o'clock this morning, we have uh, collectively 46 KNN algorithms. Each of those 46 KNNs is pretty good, most of them pretty good, at recognizing new gestures that correspond to one of the two digits in that set. What you're going to be doing in Deliverable 6 is downloading uh, a zip file that contains all of this data, taking your KNN, which recognizes, hopefully recognizes your pair of digits, grabbing uh, another student's data, adding their, the first of their two digits, and making sure that your KNN algorithm now continues to recognize your two digits plus the third digit from the other student add the second digit from that other student and your KNN should now be able to recognize four of the 10 digits. Go grab another student's data set, add a fifth and sixth digit, make sure your KNN algorithm is recognizing six out of those 10 digits, grab another data set, seven and eight, nine and 10, and that's all that's required for deliverable six. If you wanna add all of the data here, except for the few sets that are clearly not yet working, be my guest. Okay. When you do, at the end, you should see something that looks like this, hopefully. That's not what I want. There we go. Okay. This is a video that I captured from my deliverables from a few years back when we were doing 3D visualizations. So ignore the 3D visualization for now, but you'll notice that there's a drawing window, which is your Pi game window now. And underneath it, my KNN algorithm is re reporting its guesses about what I'm signing. I just switched from signing zero to signing one, and you can see underneath here that my KNN algorithm is correctly predicting that I'm signing the digit one, two, I forgot how to sign three, there's three, four, five, it's not recognizing five, there's five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, that's what we're looking for in deliverable six. Okay, you can go read Dell 6 at your leisure. Any questions about 5, 6, where we're going? Okay. Uh, sorry, last thing. For those of you that have not yet submitted your data, or as you can see here, if your KNN algorithm is not yet working, as always, you need to make sure that your, de your deliverable 5 is working, obviously, so you can go on to deliverable 6. Do make sure you get yours fixed. If you do and you submit your data, we will add them to the zip file. And once we have a few more uh, students in the zip file, I'll send out an announcement. And if you've already started on Deliverable 6, you can download that data set and you'll have the additional data. But clearly we have more than enough for all of you to start in on Deliverable 6 and, and complete it. The goal here is not to get this working with every single student's data set. This should be sufficient. Okay. Okay, so um, we are going to finish today this relatively long theme on interactive systems design. We will finish lecture nine uh, shortly, which is talking about information spaces, and then we will switch mental gears, no pun intended, 
and start talking about psychology. And as I promised last time, we've got a series of four lectures. We're going to start with relatively, uh, a relatively objective side of human cognition, which is forming mental models. What is the software behind my new phone? And using that mental model to make predictions about that system. Where in my new phone, where in the menu hierarchy can I find how to turn off alerts for new text messages? We'll then talk a little bit about memory, attention, and perception, perce uh, gestalt perception, frame of reference, and then finally up to affect or emotion. So as usual, we're moving from the objective side of human cognition to the subjective side of human cognition, and just those elements of cognition that relate to uh, HCI. Okay, so let's jump back to uh, let's jump back to lecture nine. We had talked about this idea of information spaces, and when we're creating a brand new information space like this new thing called a GUI, or this new thing called Git, or this new thing called object-oriented programming, we need to call into existence the abstract building blocks of that system. Right? For Git, it's forking and branching and pulling and pushing for operating systems, its files and folders. That exercise of calling those new abstract ideas into existence is creating the ontology to make up this new information space. We can then populate that new information space or users who have an instance of that uh, information space can create their own taxonomy. They can arrange files and folders however they like but they can't add new abstract ideas to an operating system. It's fixed, right? Okay. So we then started to think about how do we go about creating ontologies and taxonomies. As always in HCI, we want to do it from the perspective of what is the user going to be doing with this information space? I, we ended last time with this example of looking at volatility. So I'm writing a new textbook. I open up uh, my text editor, and I'm creating sections, and those sections become chapters. Usually those chapters pretty quickly on become cast in stone, and I'm not going to actually change the number of chapters uh, or their titles. So the volatility is low at the level of a chapter. So I might create separate text files for each of those chapters, and then do a lot of editing inside each uh, of those files. So if things are not, if there's low churn, things are not changing too quickly, then I want a coarse grained ontology. If things are changing relatively quickly, then I want to be able to uh, make changes to my ontology at that lower level. Okay. Let's look at some other characteristics of an information space. Uh, again, we mentioned this idea of size and the impact that has depending on whether we choose a coarse grained or a fine grained ontology. I think we talked about this last time. It's a little typo in the slides there that should say physical. As we're creating this ontology, we're calling into creation these abstract categories, these conceptual objects like things called files or when the internet was invented, these things called web pages. Uh, and links between them, directories, images, documents, and so on. We also have uh, perceptual objects, which are the way we display or advertise the structure of that ontology to the user. Right? The user isn't directly in contact with those abstract ideas. They are drawn or displayed or projected to the user uh, in some way. If we're dealing with GUIs, then we usually have icons, which re and the shape of that icon or the actual icon itself represents whether it's a file or a folder. If we go down to a more fine-grained level in the ontology, we have different file types. So the idea of a file type is itself a conceptual object. You might have different icons representing different kinds of, of file types. And then finally, we have physical objects which allow the user to interact with those perceptual objects and the abstract concepts behind them. And as usual, again, in HCI, we're trying to align, create an alignment between these abs conceptual, perceptual, and physical objects. Right? A good match obviously makes sense if we have different kinds of file types. You would want to have different kinds of icons to represent them. However, different file types are quote unquote closer to one another 
than files and folders. So files and folders on most visual operating systems have very different kinds of icons. And then within the, the class of file icons, there's slightly different variations, right? Red might represent PDF, blue represents a doc file, and so on, right? We're trying to match what the user sees with the underlying structure of our ontology. And then again, we might go even further to try and connect that with a physical object. So I've got a physical object, the mouse, and there's this abstract concept of a thing called a cursor. There's a perceptual object, which is an arrow. And when I move the physical object, the conceptual object that, uh, sorry, the perceptual object that represents a cursor also moves, right? Or a pointer, if you like. Okay. I tried to come up with an example of a poor match. Let's imagine we have a system where there's a lot of densely interconnected uh, elements, like for example, the web uh, itself, and we're storing it in different files. We take a densely connected piece of data or the web and cut it and try and store it in different files. We have different files that are holding different parts of that web, but there's dense linkage between them. Somehow not a good match. Okay, I mentioned this idea of files and folders and the fact that different file types are somehow intuitively closer to one another than a file is to a folder. So that gets us in this idea of topology. What is the actual relationship now between the various conceptual objects? If you ask somebody, uh, if you ask somebody about these four different abstract ideas, animal, human, rock, uh, and planet, and you ask them which are closer to one another, people will usually say animal and human are closer to one another uh, than animal is to, to planet. If you then ask them to define what they mean by closer, they might say they're both living organisms. They'll give you some description of that. You can play the same game by taking ideas from a software system and ask about its ontology. So let's take Git for a moment. Forking, branching, pushing, and pulling. What's the conceptual distance between these? Which pairs of those conceptual objects are closer to one another than others? Forking, branching, pushing, and pulling. Forking and branching sound similar to me. I'm not actually sure what they are. But... Even if you don't know what they are, they sound similar, right? Forking and branching, and obviously that's deliberate. They, they do a similar thing in the ontology of the Git universe, but there are obviously differences between them that are important. And pushing and pulling, as you can imagine, also are somewhat similar, but clearly they also have differences. So in the very names and the underlying metaphors that are used to represent those conceptual objects in the Git ontology, they are suggestive of their topology, which are related to one another, right? You might watch a tutorial on forking and branching and a separate tutorial on pushing and pulling, right? You understand the base, the high level concepts, and then you can drill down and ask questions like, what's the difference between forking and branching? Okay. Just to make this a little bit clearer, sometimes we're aware of the structure in an ontology and sometimes not. Let's take Wikipedia for a moment. So this is an island in the internet universe. Clearly it is a very large set of web pages. They're connected together with links. Is there any structure in Wikipedia? Yes, Crystal, do you have an idea? Um, no, this is, um, this is the whole, you the fixed point thing. Fixed point, tell us about the fixed point. So supposedly there are links. If you click on the first clickable link of Wikipedia. Okay, hold that thought. That's, your, that's exactly what I'm lead, leading into, right? For most people, they think of Wikipedia as a sort of undifferentiated mass of, of web pages and there's links between them, but there is emergent structure in Wikipedia. You can ask questions about which pages are closer to which other pages which also leads to the question of, is there a central page? Obviously there's a main page, wikipedia.org, but is there a central page? If you know what it is, don't tell us. 
There are a series of Wikipedia games you can play. One of them is open a Wikipedia page at random, as Crystal was mentioning. Click the first link in the text of that page, which will take you to another page. On that page, click the first link in that page, and so on and so forth. Which, if there's no structure in Wikipedia, you'll take some random walk through the Wikipedia universe. Turns out that that's not the case. You will eventually all end up on one page. OK, what page is it? Anybody know? Close. Psychology is near the root. Philosophy is the root, the root node. Yeah, exactly. There's a bunch of other games you can play that actually expose this underlying structure or topology in Wikipedia. So we can ask which, which pages are further or closer to one another, but do they actually feed into a central node? It turns out the answer is actually yes. Yes? Has anyone ever mapped that for like Wikipedia at a certain point in time? Good question. So, like, I the first link to each. I would imagine somebody has. Again, you could Google Wikipedia games, and there's this whole subculture around this idea, right? How to actually clarify the structure. Where did that structure come from? Presumably, it was unintentional, right? Did it emerge over time? When did it emerge? I think uh, you mentioned this uh, structure is one aspect of the Wikipedia, because Correct. you only uh, consider the first definition. Yes. Because we usually define our things uh, um, using the, the uh, high level hierarchy, right? Yeah, yes. hierarchy. So we end up in uh, uh, business. Exactly. So this, uh, this idea of a root page in Wikipedia is just one aspect of the yeah. fact that there is structure between the conceptual objects that make up the Wikipedia universe, which are web pages and links and so on, right? So we're, last time we were talking about this idea of ontology and taxonomy. What are the things that exist? And now we're moving into topology and distance and direction and navigation, which is, I know what the objects are. How are they related? What is the structure? How do I get from A to B? What is the quickest way to get from A uh, to B, right? So I'm deepening my understanding of this ontology, this new system. OK, so what do we mean by distance? In the physical world, that's pretty straightforward. In the virtual world, there's lots of different ways of measuring distance. And the particular metric, the particular way we measure distance, is relevant for the user depending on what they're trying to do, right? So uh, some obvious things is how long does it take me to get from function A to function B in a given system? If it's a, web if it's a website, how many links does it take to click through from one uh, to the other? Um, again, this idea of concept, are they in the same, similar, or uh, different categories? If I land on a random page, how far is it from the root philosophy page? I can measure it by playing this game and figuring out the number uh, of clicks. What are some other relevant ways that users might want to measure distance between two points in an information space? Time, number of clicks are some obvious ones. Maybe the amount of uh, rating. The amount of? Rating. Rating. Yeah, you need to read some instructor to go to the other. Maybe you need to rate something or fill out a survey question before you unlock some other part of the system and move on, right? So effort is another important yeah, distance metric. Think about the ASL educational game that you're going to create shortly. You are going to decide when you create that ontology, can the user arbitrarily jump to a later lesson? Right? You're going to have some sort of lesson plan or curriculum. Do they need, can they just jump from one to the next, in which, which case effort is not a distance metric for going from one lesson to another in your system? But perhaps they have to demonstrate competency of signing individual digits before they can unlock lesson plans, which is to sign pairs of digits one after the other. Right. It's up to you. It depends on how you go about trying to teach your user uh, ASL. Right? So your choice of distance in your space should be dictated by how the user wants to accomplish the task. OK. OK. So we now have these conceptual objects, possibly a taxonomy. We have underlying abstract objects, perceptual objects, physical objects. We have distance and direction. The user is trying to navigate through that space. 
Now we come back to stuff we talked about at the beginning of the course, which is how do we cast an illusion to make it more obvious to the user how they are moving through this space, right? We talked about virtual reality goggles. This is an obvious state of the art in this. We can basically just try and use physical realism, make the virtual, uh, create a virtual environment that sits on top of this ontology and brings it to life. And the user should be able to navigate it because it looks very familiar. It looks very much like the physical world. Easier said than done. I'm gonna show you an early example of an attempt to do this. In this video, you're going to see uh, the developer here is trying to create an illusion of a three-dimensional space, but is not gonna use 3D goggles or any stereoscopic vision. They're gonna try and create this illusion of th th a third dimension, which is a conceptual object in their ontology, but to do it without tricking the eyes into believing that the eyes are seeing in 3D. My name is Johnny Lee, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to perform head tracking and create desktop virtual reality displays using the Nintendo Wii Remote. Now, first, what do I mean by a desktop VR display? Well, you think about most computer screens, they're typically used to display a flat image, a little bit like this picture in this picture frame. Even if the picture is of something 3D, uh, like a video game, the picture is still flat. So it doesn't change depending on what angle you view the screen at. A desktop VR display, however, is a little bit like taking the picture out of the picture frame and then just having the frame. Now the scene actually changes depending on what angle I view the screen at. So this essentially becomes a portal or a little window into another room. Now to do this, the computer needs to know the location of your head relative to the screen, and this is called head tracking. Now to perform head tracking, we're going to be using the Wii Remote and the sensor bar but we're actually gonna be using them backwards. We're gonna put the Wii Remote next to the TV and actually move the sensor bar instead. The Wii Remote actually contains an infrared camera and the sensor bar is simply two sources of infrared light. When the camera sees the two dots of light, it's going to give an approximate location of my head horizontally, vertically, and in distance from the screen. Okay, the tricky part is, now we're gonna to have to find some way to mount the sensor bar onto our head. One common trick is to get a baseball cap and then mount the hardware to the cap. And this is definitely going to work, but it's a little bit goofy. So instead, some hardware stores sell these safety glasses with LEDs built in on the side meant to be used as headlamps. Now, if you replace the LEDs with infrared ones, you essentially get your head-mounted sensor bar and a nice sporty safety goggle form factor. Once we've created our head-mounted sensor bar and I've connected my Wii remote to my PC, we're ready to do some head tracking. Behind me is a demo program of a 3D room with some targets floating in it. Now, because the effect only works for the person wearing the sensor bar, I'm gonna to have to show you the effect through a moving camera. Now to do this, I'm literally just going to hold the sensor bar at the base of the camera and move it around. Just a quick note, to power the sensor bar, I simply turn on my Wii after I've connected my Wii remote to my PC. First, I'm going to show you what it looks like without head tracking, which is what displays normally look like. You can see that although it's a picture of a 3D room, the image looks very two-dimensional and bound to the surface of the TV. Now with head tracking turned on, the TV actually looks like the entrance to a real room. Just like in real life, by moving our head around, we can look behind objects. And if you look really closely, some targets actually appear to be floating out in front of the screen, reaching into the real world. If we get closer to the screen, we get closer to the objects, and we can even get behind the ones floating in front of the screen. As I pull the camera back, keep an eye on the frontmost target. Head tracking provides the illusion that the target is actually floating directly above the laptop screen, far in front of the TV. Now using this picture of a football stadium, if you move right, you can see more of the field. If you move left, you can see more of the stands. And if you get closer to the screen, you see more of everything, just like a real window. 
If I use my IR glasses and keep the sensor bar on the TV, I can use a second Wii remote to point and shoot like any Wii game while also doing head tracking. So now ducking and shifting your body is actually meaningful to a game. You can also see now uh, how the perspective is incorrect if you are not the one wearing glasses. So head tracking for VR displays is only going to work for one person at a time. But for that one person, the 3D experience is going to be far more realistic and immersive than anything else we see in homes today. So if you're watching this and you're a Nintendo Wii game developer, I want to see some games. Anyway, as usual, you can visit my website to download this software and find out more information about my other Wiimote projects. Thanks for watching. Okay, so uh, Johnny Lee asked at the end if uh, Nintendo would buy his product and uh, make some games. Uh, it wasn't Nintendo, but a games developer did buy his, his uh, system and Johnny Lee never needs to work again. Lucky guy, so there you go, okay. All right, so 3D without 3D goggles or a VR <coughs> headset, how? So you saw the technology, right? The Wii remote and the very cool glasses. I think it's, it's based mainly on the fact that our brain tries to perceive things the same way that we see them in a 3D space. Exactly. So as long as you can trick the brain into thinking that it's looking at something in 3D space, it's going to tell you that it's in 3D space? Exactly. If you can tr that's perfectly put. If you can trick the brain into believing it's seeing a three-dimensional space, then you see a three-dimensional space. Right? 3D glasses trick the eyes, but Johnny Lee's system tricks the brain, right? Okay. Next question. Why did it look 3D for you while you were watching the YouTube video on a two-dimensional screen? You weren't wearing the glasses. Why did it look 3D? You know why it did for Johnny, because he was wearing this, and whenever he moved his head right, the image inside the empty picture frame moves to the left and vice versa. You weren't moving your head. He said it only works for one person. What happened? I, it's not exactly the same, but I've seen I've seen like the way that humans project their themselves onto tools referred to as kinesthetic projection, where mm -hmm. like you say you're turning a car right, not turning the wheel to turn the car right. So I think that like watching a video of something behaving in that way, as long as from the perspective of the camera, it's correct. The brain still thinks, oh, I'm looking at this thing in 3D space. Exactly, right? So when you wear the glasses and you move your head, the system tricks the wearer's brain into believing that they're, wear they're looking at a three-dimensional space. The video that Johnny shot, when you watch it, tricks your brain into thinking you're wearing the device, which in turn tricks your brain into seeing a three-dimensional space. If you go back and watch the video, at the end, when you're still watching the YouTube video, but now you see Johnny in the frame and you see him moving his head and the screen moving, the illusion collapses and it goes back to looking like a two-dimensional space. So you're saying that we were being tricked into seeing because we already saw it. So if we didn't skip the floor, but you skipped ahead to that scene, we wouldn't have seen it in 3D? Not quite. So you're being, when you're watching first-person view in a video or a movie, then your brain eventually puts your body into the observer's point of view, right? It feels as if you are the one who is seeing what's being seen by the observer, right? That's step one. That's the first illusion. And then the second illusion is that observer who's in the video is moving their head, and when they move their head to the left, the video moves to the right, which creates the illusion for the observer that they're looking at a three-dimensional space. You have the illusion that you're the observer, so you see the three-dimensional space. I think the uh, environment, the uh, television, and outside at the room is very important to make the illusion more realistic. Okay. Because, yeah, because when he uh, moved the camera, you see the image in the screen move along with the environment. So you believe that those are exactly you need to see the actual johnny's room itself yes. to see that it doesn't or it it also moves when you move yeah so they along with right. uh, each other so. exactly so the room outside the screen is moving in opposition to the movement of johnny's head 
Tell me about the markers themselves. What is it about the movement of the markers that tells your brain the marker is inside the screen or floating outside the screen? How much it moves relative to how much you're moving. Absolutely, right? So the, the targets that are closer to you move how much relative to the physical scene? They move less than if it was closer. The ones that are closer to, to the observer move more, yeah. right? And the ones that are further away move less, which is this idea of motion parallax, right? When you're in the car looking at distant trees or the, the green mountains, they quote unquote move more slowly than other objects that are much closer to you, right? That is a visual phenomenon that you have literally been seeing all of your waking life, right? It is baked into your visual system, and you can exploit that to create this illusion of depth. Right? Okay, so a nice example of this idea of combining conceptual objects, which in this case is X, Y, and Z. Perceptual objects like the targets themselves, uh, and physical objects like the glasses, the sensor bar, the Wii remote, and so on. Right? If you put those things together in the right way, you bring this ontology to life. Okay, so um, if we go about now trying to design the space, again, we, we spent some time talking about visual design and aesthetic design. We want to make sure, as always, that our, ana our analogies are consistent across the space. So if we take Johnny's 3D system and create a separate game, we obviously want to make sure that things that are supposed to be outside the screen move faster than things that are quote unquote inside the screen, right? We have this analogy that we've created of this empty picture frame. When I move my head left, everything in the screen moves to the right. That should obviously be consistent across video games and we get this 3D uh, for free. Standardized templates, the sort of vision back to the visual design, uh, topological patterns. If we're, uh, if we're having our user try and learn the topology of our system, we want to maybe keep the topology itself the same. If you create an, your ASL educational game, there is one curriculum. Inside that curriculum, there are a series of lessons. And inside each lesson, there are three exercises or three mini games that you need to pass to move on to the next lesson. You probably want to make sure you have more or less the same amount of content in each lesson plan, right? It's kind of difficult for a learner if one distinct lesson is very simple and it takes a few minutes, the next one takes a few hours, right? You want to have some sort of consistency in the topology that you're creating. Okay. If you have a sufficiently complex, uh, if you have a, a sufficiently complex uh, ontology, perhaps it is not just the observer that is moving through that space, but you have avatars, other humans, other users that are remotely logged in that are navigating the space. Possibly you have AI agents that are also moving through uh, the space, and hopefully the AI agents are helping the users somehow. One of the most obvious ways that they might be able to help the human users is to organize that space and make paths within that space more obvious. One example of this, uh, one metaphor of this that's often used in the internet is virtual ants or vir virtual insects. We have agents that are moving about through a network space or a space that has a rich topology. As these agents go, they are leaving virtual signals in the space. And there's a relatively simple heuristic that you can use if you combine those things together so that collectively the agents trace out the shortest paths between various locations in the space. And that heuristic is based on how ants actually do this. Uh, for a lot of ant species, if they have their nest, uh, they leave the nest and they're randomly walking around looking for food. As they're walking around, they're leaving this physical chemical, this pheromone, as they go on their random walk. If one of them gets lucky and hits a food source, it grabs some food, turns around, and starts following its own breadcrumbs back to the nest. How does that end up creating shortest paths? It's on the return trip, it's also laying down pheromones. 
twice as strong. It's also laying down pheromones on the way back. It's twice as strong, that's right. How does that end up leading to shortest paths? I feel like cutting corners and trying to find the next bit of like pheromone after or each time you do it, you're kind of like triangulating. You can imagine it becoming a straight line over the wall. Uh, possibly. Maybe they cut out some of the, the sort of loops in this, kind of. Think about that general process being carried out by many ants. You leave the nest, maybe you walk randomly, but if there's pheromone, you follow it. And as you follow it, you leave pheromone. That's about it. How does that end up leading to shortest paths? The strongest paths will lead directly to food. The shortest paths will lead directly to food. That's the, our definition of a shortest path, but how, where do they come from? So if there's a bunch of ants finding the same food source, they would have just walked through there, so they stay. Yep. If it's a, if you mean if it's a larger pile of food, you get more ants that are gonna find it. Yes, we're getting closer. There's one detail that we're missing from this story. Absolutely. So pheromone, this chemical, whatever it is, and it's different in different species, gradually disperses, evaporates, right? But if you have more ants moving back and forth along a path, which is gonna be true if it's shorter, it's going to be reinforced more than a longer path that is being traced by the same number of ants, right? So we get this natural feedback loop where shortest paths receive more and more pheromone and longer paths gradually disperse and disappear. And if we have enough ants, you eventually get uh, the hub in the middle, which is the food and spokes radiating out on more or less shortest paths to the food. The ants don't need to remember that. That general idea has been built into a lot of AI agents that navigate through a space and sort of leave signals about the easiest way to get from point A to point B. Ants aren't the only ones that uh, carry this out. It's a little bit too early in the season yet, thank goodness, but eventually we're gonna get a big dump of snow and what happens the next morning on campus? after a fresh snowfall. You're the ants. What happens? Follow the trails and randomly made it. Follow the trails, right? And there's road and, and greens, uh, paths. What happens? There's clearly del delineated paths for you to follow, but once the snow falls, they're gone and we make them all afresh in a fresh snowfall. Tell me about those paths. They get plowed. Okay, forget the plows for a moment. <laughs> good, good point, though. Yes. Go ahead, you. Okay. Um, like as you walk over the snow, you make your own path. You make your own path. You keep making and making until you pass. Absolutely right. You make your own paths because it's snowed. It's eight twenty-seven and class is about to start in three minutes. You leave your dorm and which path do you choose? the shortest path, hopefully, which may not be there. So you are the lucky one that gets to plow through the snow and hopefully make it to class on time. However, there's someone that's even later than you and they're running behind you following the same path. Uh, and within an hour or so of the first class, if you were to take a drone shot of campus, you'll see shortest paths from the dorms to central campus, right? We're not laying pheromone, but in a way we are by leaving footfalls in the snow, right? You're helping your fellow students that are also running late. Okay, that's the physical world. What about the virtual world? What are some information spaces where AIs or maybe human users are collectively laying down paths, possibly without realizing that they're doing so? Like YouTube, um the suggested videos. Absolutely, right? So you watch enough videos on YouTube and it starts to suggest or bring pairs of videos that are closer together for you. What else is going on in YouTube as, as we are all watching various videos? I watch video A and then I type something into search completely unrelated and it brings up video B and I watch video B. Sometime later you watch video A. What happens? Um, so you, this happens a lot. I don't know if this ever happens to anybody else, but every time I look at um, 
Bob Dylan, um, what's the name of that song? Mm -hmm. Tambourine Man. Okay. Um, Mark Kahn's Walking in Memphis is always like the next video, so apparently enough people have watched Okay. <laughs> Two seemingly <laughs> unrelated music videos that are close together, right? <laughs> Shortest paths that's being created, or these two objects are being, being brought closer together by the collective viewing history of all of us, right? Sometimes you're aware of this and sometimes not. Sometimes you wonder why video B after video A tells you something about human behavior, perhaps, right? A lot of examples you can think of of this process at work. We are not collectively trying to create this structure among videos in the YouTube universe, but it is definitely collectively being made by all of us for better or worse. Okay. okay, we just talked about some examples of that. Okay, that concludes our discussion of information spaces and design. Any questions before we move on to our discussion of psychology? Very brief discussion. Okay. Okay, as promised, we're gonna start with mental models. Um, one of the most important aspects of cognition as it relates to HCI. And to illustrate this idea, I'm gonna shamelessly plug one of my previous research uh, projects here with robotics, which the project itself doesn't have anything to do with HCI. But this particular robot, which we'll talk about in a moment, this robot creates mental models. It was designed to create mental models. And the nice thing about this robot is we can look inside its programming and see exactly what its mental model looks like. We cannot do that with humans yet. We know that humans create mental models, they rotate those models, they manipulate them, and they manipulate that model to generate a prediction about what's going to happen next. We know humans do it, but we don't know the details about how we, how we do it. So we're gonna use the starfish robot here as our example to understand how this works and why it is such a useful skill to have. Okay, so starfish robot, as you can see here in the top right, it's a radially symmetric four-legged robot. It's got a front, left, right, and back leg. Each leg is made up of two parts, an upper leg part, which is a little bulkier, and a lower, or sorry, the upper leg is actually smaller, and the lower leg is a little bit bulkier. We have four legs. Each leg is made up of two parts. The lower leg is attached to the upper leg with a motor, not unlike your knee or your elbow. And the upper leg is attached to the central part of the robot with a second motor, which rotates, again, not unlike your shoulder or your hip. So we've got a robot with four knees, if you like, and four hip joints, eight motors in total. And it has just two sensors on board which tell the robot how much its main body is tilting left and right and how much its body is tilting forward and back. Two sensors and eight motors. We could, of course, tell this robot exactly how it's put together. But to make things interesting, we are not going to do so. We are gonna tell the robot that it is made up of these eight parts and the robot on its own has to construct a mental model, not of something or someone else in its environment. It's gonna create a specific kind of mental model, which is a self model. It's gonna build up an understanding of self. This robot has no camera. It can't see itself. Remember, it only has these two tilt sensors. So how does it know that it's not put together like this, or like this, or like this? How is it going to construct this mental model? When you interact with a new uh, piece of technology, you are gradually constructing a mental model of what that thing is. Let's have a look at how the starfish robot does so. As I mentioned, it's going to start life without a mental model. The physical robot is going to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Remember our discussion about John Dewey at the beginning of the semester? One useful way to think about human cognition is that it is not passive. We don't sit there and passively absorb information, except unfortunately in a classroom setting. Most of the time, we are active. We literally or metaphorically push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. And that motor sensory repercussion becomes the raw material 
In this case, we're building up a mental model. How does that work? We have our robot here. It, again, it's not really pushing against the world, it's pushing against itself. So the brain comes up with an idea, which is a set of motor commands. So it comes up with eight random numbers at the beginning, sends those eight random numbers to the eight motors, and the robot starts moving. I'll start the video here to show you this initial process. Okay, so what you're seeing here, it's very short. The robot sends eight numbers to its eight motors, and that's what happens. Remember that it has two tilt sensors on board, which sense the amount of tilt left and right, and the amount of tilt forward and back. So it captures that sensor data and holds on to it. And now it creates a random mental model. It takes those nine parts and puts them together in some random uh, way. And inside a physics engine, it now takes the same set of eight numbers and sends them to the virtual robot. The virtual robot's main body, the green cube here, tilts left and right and tilts forward and back and also generates sensor data, which I'm representing here as uh, S prime, sensor signals prime. So the robot is pushing against the world. It moves in a certain way and it senses how it tilts and then says, I wonder if I'm constructed in this way sends the motor commands and gets the motor commands back. How does it use that information to determine how good that mental model is? It's clearly not very good. It needs to construct mental models. It's made a random mental model. It needs to know, is this a good one or a bad one? If it's good, I'm done. I have a mental model. Does it compare the expected output with the actual output? Absolutely. It's going to compare the physical sensor data against the virtual sensor data. If the virtual robot tilted in the same way that the physical robot did, that's a good mental model. Throughout the deliverables, I put hints and prods for you to think carefully before you run your, you, you run your code about what you think is going to happen, and then you see what actually happens. And if there's a mismatch between what you thought was gonna happen and what actually happened, you should be able to, given a mental model of your code, isolate where you think the problem is occurring. It's not that different from what the starfish robot is doing. Okay, if it takes this random mental model and the match is poor, there's a lot of differences between the physical sensor data and the virtual sensor data, it takes that random mental model makes a copy of that random mental model, and then bends one or a couple of the objects in there, or rearranges their attachment, makes a slight change to this second mental model. What do you think it does with this second mental model? It knows the first one was pretty bad, makes a slightly modified, randomly modified copy of it. Now what happens? Rinse and repeat, exactly. Perform, send the same motor commands to that second mental model. Capture the new virtual sensor data. For that second model, compare physical and virtual sensor data. Let's imagine in this case that the match is closer. It's still probably pretty big, but imagine that, that match is a little bit closer for the second model compared to the first model. What do you think the physical robot is gonna do in that case? It knows one model is better than the other. I'll throw out the first model and go with the second one. Throw, out the, throw away the first mental model, take this one, make a randomly modified copy of that one, rinse and repeat, compare, compare, and iterate through that process. And typically this is the result. And again, here's, you're gonna see the physical robot generating some sensor data. And here it is going through a whole bunch of these mental models. If you watch carefully, I'll back this up, the green object is always rotating about 10 degrees into the screen, which based on my shoddy camera work here is actually correct. All of these virtual mental models now are all matching the sensor data from the physical robot. 
So the ro from the robot's point of view, it's got a problem. What's the problem? It's got a whole bunch of these different mental models, which are all agreeing with the data from the real world. They'll agree they don't know which one to take and move on with. The robot doesn't know much, but it knows it can't look like that and look like the other one and look like the other one. It has multiple mental models, which are all correct. Right? It could be this, it could be that, I don't know. This, from the robot's point of view, it's going to have to do something else. From a user's point of view, is interacting with your software. The user at this point might get frustrated. I'm trying to do something and I can't refine my mental model. I'm not sure why I'm getting the result I'm getting. It might be because the system put the function in that part of the menu hierarchy, or maybe they put the function in that other part of the menu hierarchy. I'm confused. My understanding of this system doesn't make sense. There's different explanations for what I'm seeing. What do you think the robot does in this case? It does something unrelated and see if it's still right. Go back, right? As John Dewey would say, go push against the world again, right? So you can see on the bottom left here, this is the first cycle of 16. So the robot does go back and collect some new sensor data and then refine its self-models against not just the first action and the first sensory repercussion, but now also the second action and the second set of sensory repercussion. The mental models now have a harder task. They have to explain or reproduce the first set of sensory repercussions and the second set of sensory repercussions. We repeat this in this particular uh, experiment that we recorded. It made little progress up until the eighth cycle. So what you're seeing now is the eighth time that the starfish robot has performed some action. There it is. And this is the robot's understanding at this point in the experiment. This mental model, believe it or not, can explain the previous seven actions and sensory repercussions. And so can that one and that one and that one but they cannot explain the eighth one that has just been added. So partway through this search process, this happens. I'll play it again for you. The robot has suddenly discovered this mental model, which is close, but not perfect. It's got three of the legs right, but one leg is in the wrong place and making randomly modified copies of this one, it eventually hits on this one, which is not perfect, but pretty close. If we let this process continue, this is the 16th cycle. If we ask the robot about its mental model at this point, it says, that's my mental model. Sorry, I jumped, jumped back too far. The robot has one mental model. It says, no matter how much more I push against the world and observe how the world pushes back, all that data that I keep collecting, all it does is further validate this hypothesis. This is my best understanding of the thing I'm trying to model, which in this case is self. So far, so good. Any questions? OK, so that's the how. This robot creates a mental model, but what about the why? Why does it bother creating a mental model? For the robot and for us, the usefulness of a mental model is obviously we can make predictions about things that might happen to this thing, which in this case is the robot's body. We can make predictions about what's going to happen in the world before we actually do it in reality. Prediction is extremely important, especially for biological organisms because it allows our hypotheses to die in our stead. I think that I'm standing uh, on some solid ground outside, and it kind of looks like there may be the edge of a cliff about three steps in front of me. But it's cloudy or misty, or it's raining, it's very windy. I'm not quite sure that there's a cliff in front of me. Why don't I just take three steps and see what happens? I'm not going to make a prediction. I'm just going to try it out in reality. Not a very good Darwinian strategy. So not surprisingly, in retrospect, 
us and probably lots of other species evolved the ability to create mental models. I've got lots of uncertainty about what I'm sensing or what I'm seeing, but I think there is a mo I'm creating a model of myself, which is three feet away from what I think is a cliff, and let's run that forward. I'm gonna use that model to make a prediction. My virtual self in my head is gonna take three virtual steps forward, and if it actually is a cliff, that virtual copy of myself is not gonna do very well, right? It's gonna be in a lot of trouble, so my prediction says that's dangerous, I'm not gonna do it in reality, right? Makes sense. Okay, useful for organisms, useful for robots as well. In this case, we've asked the robot, now that it's built up a mental model, to use it to make predictions. We've asked the robot to walk from one side of the table to the other, not really a dangerous task, but before it tries doing that in reality, we've asked it to use the mental model to figure out how to do it first and then try it in reality. Even for an unsafe task, like walking from one side of the table to the other, it might take this robot several hundred attempts to figure out how to coordinate its motion to do so, which requires a lot of time. Uh, in this case, it would have flat flatted its battery long before it ever figured out how to do it. We would have had to change the battery out. It's still costly, maybe not dangerous, but costly to do so. So our robot sits still and it tries out lots of different ideas. And this is the last idea it came up with, which as you can see, causes the robot to move forward. So you're watching two things here. You're watching the mental model, which you can see, and the mental model is being animated by the robot's prediction. The robot says, what will happen if I move motor one and motor five and then motor three and then motor six? I predict this is what will happen. And of course, we shot this video for a reason. In this case, in this case the robot was uh, correct. This research project took us th about three years to get right. This was shot at about 3 a.m. in a basement lab at Cornell. And there was an undergraduate student that was working at a bench sitting behind us. And this crazy thing started moving. And there were three of us. And we all went absolutely crazy. And we were screaming and high-fiving. The student turned around to see what all the commotion was, saw this thing, and said, dude, that's the evil starfish. <laughs> so for better or for worse, since, since uh, 2006, this has been known as the evil starfish for, for obvious reasons. OK. Enough about the evil starfish. We could spend all day, I could spend all day talking about it. The purpose here is to show you in a simplified way a machine, which in this case can create a mental model. But more importantly for us, the reason why we might want to enable machines to create mental models because they can use them to make predictions about ideas before carrying them out in reality. Obviously, coding and everything for that project took a really long time, but yes. how long does it take the robot once everything's all set? Good question. To go through the computations and the tests? Yeah, so how long did it take the robot to figure all this out? Uh, this was 2006 technology. It took um, 15 minutes for each cycle, so 15 times 16 whatever that works out to be. So a couple, a couple hours, and then it's got a mental model and is able to figure out how to, how to use it. Okay. If we redid this today with cloud technology and Bluetooth, it would probably be much, much faster. Okay. Okay. So now, back to HCI. Uh, obviously, we do this as well, but again, from an HCI perspective, different users who are using the same technology create very different mental models of that technology, depending on who they are, their expertise, what they want to use the technology for. You can see how this uh, slide is a little dated, talking about MP3 players. Um, I'm picking on grandmothers here, but user X is not really an expert with technology. They want to buy something that plays music. For them, that's an MP3 player. They might, walk into, uh, they might walk into Best Buy and ask a staff member, does this thing over here play songs? And if the staff member says yes, it's an MP3 player. It could be a smartphone, it could be an iPod, it could be who knows what these days. For this person, there is a large class of technologies which play music, that's what they do, right? Okay, 
a perhaps slightly more advanced user, a discretionary user like myself. As I mentioned, I just bought a new phone. I'm not quite sure about the menu hierarchy. My mental model tells me whatever this phone is, it probably has a, a menu hierarchy. But I'm unsure about where to find certain functions within that hierarchy. So not unlike the evil starfish, I'm going to start pushing against the world, which in this case is playing with my phone and navigating and exploring and seeing what my phone says back. I might do it at random, but that's not very efficient, right? I know some things. I've had smartphones before, so my search is much more focused. I'm using my mental model that I built up uh, using previous phones to direct my search on this new phone. Where is turn off new message alarm? It's either in notifications or sounds, or it's in the message uh, sub-hierarchy, right? It's probably in one of those two. It's not in the phone call sub-hierarchy. It's not in Google Chrome. It's not in some other app. It's in one of these two, right? My mental model, like we saw with Evil Starfish, is making two predictions. Either I'm going to go down this path and find it, or I'm not, or I'm going to go down that path and find it, or I'm not. Okay. Uh, early adopters uh, throw away their mental model. They don't care. They get a new piece of tech and they systematically work through all combinations and permutations of the technology to learn everything that it does. Three very different users looking at or playing with this. They have very different mental models and they're using them in very different ways. Right? When you eventually show your Leap Motion device and surrounding software to a family member when you go home for Thanksgiving, what is their mental model? When you put that thing on the desk in front of them and turn on your code and it's running, what's going on in their head? What is the mental model that they're going to bring to bear on this problem? Okay. Depending on how much they decide to link it with the computer itself, they might think that you interact with touching it. They might think that, right, exactly. It has a shiny black surface, right? So the physical object itself is projecting in affordance. Most people today, even if you're not uh, very familiar with technology, a black shiny surface, especially something that has a wire that's running into the computer, suggests you can touch the surface, right? That's a very plausible. And, you, and makes perfect sense, a good mental model, the wrong mental model, right? So we want to somehow suppress that affordance and project something on the screen to lead them away from that mental model and towards something else. That's what you're going to be doing in Deliverable 7. So Deliverable 6, we're going to finish up the machine learning part. And we're going to switch back to doing some visualizations in Pygame so that they're not just looking at the device. They're also seeing something in your Pygame window that says, don't press, don't grab it like a mouse, which is another possible uh, interpretation of what's in front of them. Do something else. Right? Depends on what you think they're going to do. OK. OK. Uh, how do we build up a mental model? As we've said so far, it's usually by doing something and seeing how the, in our case, technology responds. We've got our little cell phone here in a box. What box is this? Reminiscing about the beginning of the semester. We put this thing in a box and we're going to experiment with it and see how it responds. Remember all the way back to the beginning of semester. No? The Skinner box. B.F. Skinner, this idea about trying to understand animal behavior. We want to build up a mental model of how animals behave. Put them in a box, restrict the input, which in our case, we're going to restrict what we do with the phone, and limit the kinds of things that the phone, in this case, can give us back. OK, we've got this strange device, which is maybe not a phone, but a leap motion device. We don't know much about it. We just know that we can't touch it. And we can't grasp it and move it like a mouse. So let's just start doing different things and see what happens, right? This is the simplest thing to do. Let's poke and prod it. And 
For example, we might supply to this device different kinds of stimuli, touch it, grab it, move it, wave our hand over it, shake it up and down, stimuli one, two, three through N. And when we do, we see something flash on the screen, but we might start to notice that there's a relationship between the poking and prodding and what the system gives us back. It doesn't give us back random responses for every random thing we're doing to the device. Either it shows us nothing, or it shows us something. Perhaps there are two general classes of responses. For some users who aren't that familiar with technology or don't like to use technology, that's where things end. Uh, a number of years ago, I taught my father how to use a word processor. He is not a big fan of technology, uh, but he wanted to obviously write letters and, and so on. So I wrote down on a huge number of post-it notes, if you want to X, click this, then click this. If you want to do Y, click this, click that. By the end of the year, his whole home office was covered in hundreds of post-it notes. It wasn't perfect. But for him, at least, he knew somewhere there was a post-it note for what he wanted to do. He didn't know what a word processor was, how it worked. Most importantly, he did not want to know, right? So I did my best to take into account the particular user that I was dealing with. Some of you may have had similar experiences. He never took the next step of conceptual compression to understand exactly how the system works, right? If you poke and prod a new technology and realize that there are two different types of results, that often leads you to improving on the mental model. In rote learning, we just have a, a flat list of if I do this, the system beeps or it doesn't beep, to a more nuanced mental model which says it looks like there's sort of two classes of things that can happen. If I wave my hand over it, I get this kind of response. If I put my hand on top of the device, I get some other response. So somewhere inside this system, there are two things going on. There's two processors. If your user knows anything about code, they'll guess there's an if-then statement somewhere in your code. If this, then do this. If that, then do that, right? Why bother? Why bother going to this effort of conceptual compression? Why not just leave things with a whole bunch of post-it notes? Efficiency. Efficiency how? So if you build conceptual compression in your model and proof, then you don't have to go through your 1,000 sticky notes to figure out how to do it. Okay. It, more efficient, right? So imagine we, ha we are equipped with one of these two mental models. We're now done building the mental model. And as I mentioned before, we're going through this effort because we want to use it to do something, right? I want to do X. In the case of mental model one, I've got to go looking for X and maybe search is inefficient. It takes me a while to find the post-it note or the particular stimuli response pair that I'm looking for. Here, I know about X. I know that X belongs to stimuli type two, so I can make a prediction about what's gonna happen. Yes, I want result type two, so I'm gonna carry out X. Efficiency is one thing. What else? Let's go back to the example of my father here who's got all his post-it notes, which took significant months of effort. If there's a gap in the post-it notes, you wouldn't know what to do. Exactly, I'd get the dreaded phone call. I can't find a post-it note for Z. I want to spell check. There's no spell check post-it note, right? There's no way for him to use this mental model to predict where to find the spell checking function. He knows enough about word processors, processors to know this thing can check his spelling for him. But if he doesn't have that post-it note, he can't use this mental model to find it, right? Remember, we're always trying to build the mental model for it to be useful, right? One of the, the, the main advantage of conceptual compression is if your user performs it and their structure matches the actual structure underlying your system, you can, or they can, formulate a novel function, something they want to do with your system, run it through this mental model and predict where it is or how to actually carry it out, even if it's not explicitly listed here. I think um, 
you build a mental model with the, the uh, notes in your father's mind. Yeah, he has so, a mental model. It's yeah. this one. So every time he come up with a question, he's looking for the, the notes. And if he cannot find it, he call you. Exactly. So that's, that's his uh, mental model. But that's model. his mental model, exactly. <laughs> his mental model includes me, yeah, right? Unfortunately, <laughs> I'd like to sort of make, exactly, exactly. This is also not unlike the KNN algorithm that we were discussing. One of the issues with machine learning is trying to make sure that your machine learning algorithm doesn't do this, that it does this. One of the important things that your KNN is trying to do is conceptual compression. It grabs, it gets a new frame of data, or you give it a new frame of data from Leap Motion. It is something it's never seen before, so it can't look it up in a set of uh, examples here. It's trying to find the closest one, right? So it's not quite this, KNN is closer to this. KNN can still handle novel data because it simply just finds the closest elements in its flat list of training data and uses that to make its prediction. The nice thing about KNN is it's simple. The problem with it, of course, is that it doesn't really have an understanding of the underlying structure of what's going on. So there are more high-powered machine learning algorithms that do more conceptual compression. And by doing so, in theory, they can handle new situations that are further from the training set. Things that are more different from things they've seen before. The KNN algorithm, if it gets a new experience, a new piece of data that's too far from anything it's seen before, doesn't do very well. Okay. Okay. All right. As I mentioned, we do this. And perhaps we'll end with this today. Um, obviously, we're talking about psychology, so we can't avo avoid optical illusions. You're building a mental model of this very simple object that you see on the screen, which is the Necker cube. I, you've probably seen this illusion before, but regardless of whether you have or not, I want you to just stare for a few seconds at the Necker cube. I'm going to stop talking in a moment. Focus on it and let your brain create hypotheses or create mental models of what it's seeing. Okay. Which face or square is closer to you, the lower left one or the upper right one? It's a ridiculous question, right? Neither is closer to you. Ah, uh, it depends on which corner you stare at. Hopefully when you were just looking at this in a relaxed manner, maybe you were focusing your attention actively. But if you were just passively, quote unquote, lying back and observing the Necker cube, which one is it? Sorry, can you just zoom in a little? Zoom in a little, okay. Maybe. Can I? Yes, I can. How's that? Which face is closer to you, the lower left or the upper right? Lower left. The lower left. Depend on how your uh, perspective. It depends on your perspective, you, you, right? You, uh, Possibly. Yeah, lean up, up your head, you maybe see that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so it sort of depends on how you look at it, definitely. Uh, maybe how you orient your head. How many people saw, at least for some of the time, you can see that the lower left is closer to you? How many of you also saw the upper right closer to you? How many of you saw both from time to time? Okay, so if you stare at this long enough, and watch out, it can be hypnotic, you might go back and forth between seeing the lower left and the upper right. Why? What's happening? What's causing your brain to switch between these? Sorry? You have, both, you have both models, right? Your brain is trying to interpret this as a 3D object because, of course, there's lots of hints here to try and suggest that it is. So your brain has those two mental models, and it's trying to now make a prediction using those two models to determine which of the two is correct. Perhaps you focus your eyes on this corner, and you can kind of see the rest of the structure in your peripheral view. 
So your mental model makes a prediction, and it sends it to your eyes, and your eye muscles cause your eyes to saccade or switch and land on this point. And your, your mental model is actually saying, if you do, if you make that jump, you should see those three uh, edges radiating out from that node to have this exact angle, more or less. And your actual observation is not quite true. If you were looking at an actual three-dimensional cube and you were looking at the lower left corner and you jumped and looked at the upper right front corner, the angles you would see for an actual cube are gonna be slightly different from the Necker cube. So it says, I was wrong. It's not that the lower left pane is closer. So I'm gonna set that mental model aside. I collected some data that invalidated it. I think it's the upper right that's closer. So now you see the upper right. Your brain perhaps is, or your eyes are looking at this point. That other mental model makes a prediction. You jump down here and the project, the what you actually see matched up with your prediction is off, your brain throws away that mental model and says, maybe the lower left face is closer to me. And back and forth you go. How many of you had the experience where it actually felt like the pains were alternating? You saw front left, then upper right. What was the frequency at which they switched? How quickly did it feel like that alternation was happening? Most, okay. Okay. Maybe slower based on which one you think is more true. What about for those that saw it alternating? How fast? Tw 10 times a second? Once every 10 seconds? It started off kind of slow for me, where I was focused on the bottom right, most, okay. or bottom left most. But then I looked at the top right, and that popped up. Okay. So I went back and then I started it's to sped up. And it sped up. For most people, it's about once per second. Why it's once per second, one of the many mysteries of neural science. We'll end there. Thanks very much. We'll see you. You have a quiz due tonight. We'll see you on Thursday.